Thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm Megan Clayton, an Extension Range Specialist based in the Corpus Christi Research and Extension Center down south. Um, I cover counties along the coast and south of San Antonio, providing county extension agents with support for rangeland management resources and also conducting research. So I feel like I have a pretty cool job. I've been lucky enough to be here in Corpus Christi to work with a great team of um, other researchers, both with Texas A&M AgriLife and with Texas A&M Corpus Christi, doing research with drones or UAVs, unmanned um, aircraft. And Texas A&M Corpus Christi was actually one of the first schools to get a national grant to um, fund this sort of research. So pretty exciting to be working with some of those guys who are far, far smarter than me. And what we're doing is trying to take the applications where we feel it would be useful uh, for range and pasture and having those guys understand our needs and using their technical capabilities with UAVs to process the data. So uh, really a cool partnership and I'm very thankful to be here and to be working with them. So uh, today the game plan is to talk about just drone basics for those of you who are interested in drones but have maybe never actually flown a drone. Um, we'll talk about some specific models just because I hate listening to something and not having specific names I can go back and research on my own later. Then we're going to talk about potential uses in range and pasture, some things that we've been looking at, some things you might be able to already do with drones and kind of where we think some of that research is heading. And then third, we'll talk about UAV rules. So. Uh, rules are not the fun part to talk about, but very, very important to make sure that you're operating safely and within the guidelines provided by the FAA, or Federal Aviation Administration, who's actually governing our use of drones on rangelands. So to get started, uh, the very basics are that there's two different types of unmanned aircraft. One would be a fixed wing, which is like an airplane. Of course, it generates lift through its wings. The advantage to fixed wings is that they have longer endurance time. So that means you could cover a much more land on a single battery using a fixed wing. They generally fly a lot faster. They do need room to launch and land. So the example down there is an EB unit. Um, that unit feels like really cheap styrofoam, but it has very expensive components within it that have not only sensors, but GPS units um, to help with navigation. That unit uh, needs a little bit of area for you to launch, so normally somebody holds that in both their hands, moves it back and forth, and then throws it up in the air to launch. And then to land, sometimes people will put down tarps, or in some situations they'll even try to catch it, but just like you could imagine a small airplane coming down, it does need to be a sort of open space so that it doesn't get caught in any trees. Um, one disadvantage on ranches is, is that if you don't have that sort of open area, then you're kind of limited on your use with a fixed wing. The second disadvantage with fixed wings is their cost. So right now, a fixed wing is going to run you anywhere from $2,500 to $20,000 plus. A pretty expensive piece of equipment. So most of our research that we're doing, it, the data is collected with a fixed wing. That way we can cover more area more quickly. Um, but for actual use on rangelands, I think it's much more practical for people to possibly buy rotaries or rotocopters. These are more like helicopters, what you're seeing over on the right-hand side of the screen. Their lift is, of course, by propellers, just like a helicopter. Um, they can't carry as much payload on them, but they're a little bit more flexible. And I really like that when you're flying, if you want to get a little closer look or take another look at something, it's easy to hover with a, with a rotocopter, whereas with a fixed wing, if you wanted a better look, you would have a couple of choices. One, to fly back by it, or two, to look at your uh, data, like your video or your still shots on your computer afterwards. So uh, you cannot actually stop and hover with a fixed wing. Um, you can do vertical takeoff and landing with the rotocopters, which is very helpful, especially if you have a lot of brush or uh, areas that you'll need to be uh, avoiding, whereas you need more room to launch and land with that fixed wing. And a huge plus is that rotocopters, even the really nice ones that can take some very nice photography, uh, run about $600 to $1,600. So when I'm speaking with landowners, typically we're talking about rotocopters, 
everything that I own uh, are varying sizes of rotocopters. So I just feel like they have a lot more applicability for what we're looking for right now on ranches. So do know that they're coming out with some really cool hybrids where you could actually take off like a helicopter with this unit and then those roto uh, propellers would tuck in and this unit can fly like an airplane. So um, they do have some hybrids available. They're quite pricey right now, but just like everything we're talking before this session about uh, my really outdated iPhone, um, this technology is quickly evolving and I think over time, these type of units might become more feasible in price. So something to definitely keep in mind and look at. Okay, so some example rotocopters that you might want to think about. Uh, one I think is probably the most popular series being the Phantom series. The Phantoms are produced by a company called DJI. That's the letters DJI. They're a foreign company. They probably have uh, the largest amount of sales in the drone market right now. They're probably the most popular if we had to take a poll. Um, they come oftentimes like this unit, this Phantom 3 that's pictured here, as a set. So when you unbox that, it already has the camera attached. That camera can take video and pictures. Um, it has a handset that comes with it that you would use with your phone or your tablet to fly. And it's ready to go out of the box. Uh, there's no mechanical uh, needs on this piece of equipment. The flight time is just slightly over 20 minutes. That's depending on the wind and what kind of environment you're flying in. Um, they do sell extra batteries, of course, so you could land the unit and switch out batteries as you go. But a single battery is typically going to last you about 20 minutes. Um, so the Pro, as opposed to a Phantom 3 Standard or an Advanced, is a slightly better camera. So right now I own a Phantom 3 Pro. That Pro is running about $750 for a package right now. Whereas the 4, that's the next step up, think of it like an iPhone, the next iPhone that comes out um, is running about $1,200 to $1,500. So the 4 has a few different features that you might be interested in. Some of them are pretty uh, nebulous, like you can put on the, the rotors in so many seconds. Uh, stuff like that doesn't really impress me, so that wasn't a reason for me to upgrade. Um, but it is nice that the 4s come with some object avoidance, so they have some cameras on other sides. Um, of the rotocopter, not for taking pictures, but for strictly object avoidance. So that means if you're driving or flying up to a tree, the uh, Phantom 4 will stop and my Phantom 3 will fly right into that tree. So um, if that's a concern to you, then that might be something that you would be looking at upgrading for. The example of the 3DR solo drone over on the right is made to show you that there are some drones that come without cameras attached and that could be really advantageous if you already own something like a GoPro or a nice Canon camera that you plan to attach to your drone. So for instance this solo drone was going for about $300 and if you already owned a GoPro you could just buy a gimbal which is a fancy word for the little piece that attaches the camera and an SD card and you would be ready to go. So um, that too is an option. You don't have to buy these packages that already come with the camera, but in my opinion, they're much, much more easy to um, deploy than a lot of the others that you have to fix up for yourself, unless you're a little bit more advanced or you really like that mechanical side of things. <clears throat> Another uh, recent purchase I had was the Evo. Uh, this is made by Autel which is an American company. Um, they're based out of Washington. They have ties to a larger company um, that's in China. So technically they're slightly foreign too, but when you call in for um, support, the Evo would be an American made company. And this little unit tucks in, so it's very compact, so it's easy to travel with. It has object avoidance on all sides. Um, it has a really nice battery life for such a small drone. Um, it's really a nice drone and a, another option for you as opposed to just promoting DJI products. Um, another little drone that I just purchased, if you're interested in one just for fun. Oh, I should have said the Evo runs about a thousand dollars for its platform right now. If you wanted one just for fun or you're thinking maybe you want to get one for your grandkids to fly at your place, 
Um, I did buy a DJI Tello, that's T-E-L-L-O. It's a small little drone that does hover, so that's something very important to look for when you're trying to purchase a drone, because those that don't hover are very, very difficult to fly. Um, would be very hard for a child to fly. Um, the Tello also uh, does tricks in the air, has a lot of fun features, and that one runs $100. So you might want to purchase a couple extra batteries because the battery life isn't that long, but a really cool drone to have just for fun. So how exactly do drones work? Uh, I get this question a lot. And basically when you buy a drone, so let's take my Phantom for example, out of the box it already has a camera attached. What you'll need is a smartphone or a tablet that you could download an app on that would be what you fly it through. So what I would do is download probably the DJI Go, since that's a DJI product. Um, I would download that app and that is what I could either manually fly my drone with or I could preset a path that I want that drone to fly. So for instance, if I wanted to um, check a fence line, I could click on the map and set the path of where I wanted that drone to fly and it would um, take off and fly that path and then come back to the area where you took off from. So approximately it would land in your area again. Um, but no, there's other apps available, third-party apps like Drone Deploy, um, there's Pix40 Capture, there's other apps other than the ones that come specifically with that drone company, but you just want to make sure you get one that's compatible with the drone that you're using and that's easy for you to operate. So again, you could fly manually or set a path on most drones today. Um, most of the ones like a Phantom can fly for 20 to 30 minutes. You might want to consider purchasing extra batteries in a multi-charger. So when you're thinking about purchasing a really cheap drone, even if you found a really cheap drone that hovers, keep in mind that you are investing in these batteries. So your cost that you have in this product will be a little bit higher maybe than you initially thought. Um, there are a lot of drones that have battery indicators in them. So for instance, uh, with my Phantom, I could set it to alert me at 30% battery left. And then when it got down to say 15% battery left, it would automatically come and land. So um, it's got some kind of dummy proof things put into that. So it's really hard to uh, not know how to fly a drone today because they have so many extra bells and whistles put onto these drones that make them easier to fly. They also have beginner mode where it won't allow you to fly too far or too high while you get used to how you could fly that drone. They also have a lot of launch and return options. So on the Phantom, you can hit a button and it will launch into air about head high and it'll just hover there until you're ready to go. Um, and then they also have a return to home button. So when you get out there and you get confused about which way maybe your camera's turned and you want to return to home, you could simply hit that button and here your drone will come. Um, a lot of times I would suggest that you manually take over and actually land the drone to make sure you get it where you want it um, because it's not going to land exactly where you took off from, but it does come pretty close. So they're really nice backup features that these drones come with. DJI, in, in particular, that company um, announced that they'll be adding ADS-B receivers to all of their new drones that they'll be releasing, I think starting in January. Um, and these are anti-collision warning systems um, for manned aircraft. So it's going to put an alert on your handset when there's a manned aircraft, uh, meaning piloted aircraft, nearby. And that's going to be really helpful to increase the safety with drone flights for sure. Um, there's also YouTube videos. So um, a lot of times I tell people, you know, when you get your drone in, you could probably just throw out the user manual because the YouTube videos that are done by these drone nerds are just amazing. I mean, they tell you everything from exactly how to unbox this drone to uh, how to put it together, how to up update the software that's on it. Um, really cool information. I wish I knew which uh, company to credit for this, but I did watch a video that showed you how to get used to flying your drone when you first get it. Um, because if you did not grow up uh, playing video games, you are starting out with a slightly disadvantaged flight ability because these are a lot like video games. Um, so I always tell my mom that it's her fault that I'm a bad uh, pilot because she never allowed us to have video games. But um, 
you can start out flying where you fly like in a straight square in front of you. Nothing fancy. After you get the hang of that, you can start to fly in circles. So a little bit more uh, skill needed to smoothly fly in a circle. And then you can start to change which direction your uh, camera is facing and then start practicing with how you would have to adapt to move the controllers depending on which way your camera is going. So over time you can train your brain very well uh, to pilot these things. It just takes a little bit of practice right out of the box. So sensors, these drones, I said some of them come with a camera and a sensor is just a fancy word for the camera. Um, it's easiest to purchase one that's already connected, so it's already a set unit. But know that there's a lot of drones that you can add different cameras to or change them out, and there's packages available for doing that that come with all of the hardware that you need and the gimbal that you need to attach those. Um, but make sure that that camera is compatible before you purchase it, because you wouldn't want to buy an expensive camera and then find out that it doesn't actually go on that drone or vice versa. Uh, the first type of sensor is just a visual camera, so that's like your RGB or your red, blue, green, blue camera. That's like the normal, um, say, Canon digital camera that you would take a picture at at your family reunion. Same exact thing. They just have gimbals that will mount these onto your drone. Um, also, GoPros are good options. A lot of people like to put their GoPros on uh, drones and get some really cool footage. Another type of sensor would be a thermal sensor. These cameras um, are decreasing in price. They used to be very, very expensive outside of uh, what probably most landowners would want to invest. But it's neat to have thermal images because you can um, see a vegetation stress or hot or cold spots or it picks out water. Um, you could see animals under brush as opposed to only being able to count those that are outside of the brushy area. Um, really cool uses for thermal cameras, um, especially in our research. And now that they're decreasing in price, it's pretty neat to have that option. Um, number three is a hyperspectral or a multispectral camera. Um, these basically are very fancy cameras that include infrared and ultraviolet spectrum. So um, what they're allowing you to do is take these images, and a lot of times these images are stitched together in what's called an orthomosaic. It's a fancy word for a bunch of photos overlaid on each other that they create into one photo. So they take this ortho mosaic and you can turn on and off different spectrums and uh, be able to pick out different things on your landscape. So I am a range specialist, so a bit of a plant nerd. So it's very exciting to me that you would be able to turn some of these on and off and perhaps pick out certain plant species over others. And you could use this information to tell you a lot about uh, the management that you might need to do on that piece of property. So. Uh, lots of uses with multispectral or even more advanced hyperspectral cameras. So you might be thinking, why are drones so important? Like, why do we think this is something we should really be doing research in? Um, one, of course, they're very convenient. So you have access to areas that you can't get to in any other way. Um, we've already seen with a lot of these natural disasters that drones are deployed um, in order to get a visual bird's eye view of areas that normally it would be very difficult to even get a helicopter to call in to see these um, in real time. Um, you can also do multiple measurements over a year. So I was talking about using them to monitor to make management decisions. And even if you did have the ability to hire a helicopter to come in to fly that, more than likely you wouldn't be able to command that helicopter or pay for that helicopter to come many times throughout the growing season. So it's nice that if you had a drone, you could take as many measurements over the course of the year as you felt necessary. Also, uh, the overall management picture could really help you with decision making. So that's our ultimate goal is to figure out how can we use these drones to make better management decisions or uh, increase our ease of use of our managing our ranches. So pretty simple. It's been said that if you can see it with your naked eye, there is a way to automate that. And so that's our, our thing is we're thinking if we can figure out how to use drones for this, then we can create some software programs that landowners are going to be able to use easily um, to adapt to their place. So let's talk about potential uses for drones on ranches. One, of course, right now, out of the box, you could go buy one today and start scouting difficult to reach areas. You could also check your fence lines, your roads, your feeders, your waters, 
um, anything related to your operation that you normally would have to drive around and take quite a bit of time, maybe even get out of the truck to take a look. Um, you could see this aerially very quickly. You could find missing animals. You could uh, herd your animals, although I'll warn you that if you start training them to run from your drone, it will be difficult to use your drone to monitor that herd later on. So be careful about how you apply that. Um, also for animal health. So uh, for things like Estrotech tags that shows whether or not uh, an animal comes back into heat or has been bred already, um, can be easily seen by the air with these drones. Um, how much forage you have for livestock. We have a student working on that as we speak and also the nutritive value of forage. So we're able to uh, start using things such as NDVI or greenness factors and comparing that to the nutritive value of that forage when we clip it and send it off to a lab. Also, we have uh, the ability to look for weed and brush encroachment and to map that even over time. So we can not only uh, start to differentiate certain weeds or brush species from each other, um, and then we could quantify how much we have coverage of that and whether or not that would be worth treating or maybe how much that would cost us to treat. Um, but we can also map over time if that uh, weed is in fact expanding in its range or if it's pretty well staying put. And finally, animal counts. So we talked a little bit about maybe using thermal for that. Uh, we'll look at some pictures I have in here, but um, it is possible to count cattle or even wildlife with these drones. Right now, we're a little bit limited because of the, the battery time. Um, if you can't cover a huge area with one battery and you have to land it and put another battery in and then go back to your tracks, um, that takes a little bit of time and the fear would be that those animals would shift during those periods. Um, so it is a little bit difficult to uh, do that right now, but there is some possibility, especially as our technology increases and our battery lives get longer. Um, I think that's going to be a big deal in the future. So here's an example of a pasture that we flew with Texas A&M Corpus Christi on Welder Wildlife Refuge. Um, this was done back in 2015 and we flew it with an EB unit, which is a fixed wing unit like you saw, um, I believe on the second slide that I went over. And we flew about 700 acres that day and took over a thousand images that um, each image went down to a one inch pixel. So that didn't necessarily mean that that was clear at one inch, but the pixel size was a one inch pixel. Um, so when we flew this, I believe we had to land to change the battery out four or five times. Um, so you can imagine it took a while to cover this 700 acres, even with the fixed wing. Um, but what they did is take a picture every so many seconds and those pictures had overlap. And then when they laid all those pictures over on each other, they made this ortho mosaic of it, which is a very fine detailed picture of a very large pasture. So when we zoom in here, um, let me grab the pointer here. You can see we were lucky because you can see with the naked eye, there's the cows. Um, they happen to have Brahmin cattle. So it's very easy to pick out their little white bodies, um, but that's where they were in that picture. And then here again, you can see uh, pretty clearly there's cows. So if we wanted to count them in this situation, we could, unless they were underneath brush. So if they were bedded down underneath brush during the time of day when we were flying, uh, we would have missed them with a typical uh, camera. So here's what we were trying to do at the time. We had these cows in here and we worked with a computer scientist who was trying to pick out their body shape, the cow's body shape, and that way they could take that large ortho mosaic that we saw and just scan it with a computer program and it could tell you how many cattle you have in that pasture. She had a lot of false positives and false negatives, so it didn't really work out. Plus we had the issue of the brush that could potentially be hiding some of those animals. So next we looked at video recognition of cattle. And if you've heard of YOLO, you only live once, there's actually a video program called YOLO that's you only look once. So we were trying to train that program through algorithms to pick up the shape of the cow. And we only flew a couple of sites, but you could see uh, here in the background, this is all a regular camera and it was mounted at the same time as a thermal camera right here. So it's the same image and you can really see where those cows popped out on the landscape. And that would make them very easy to count. Um, right now, the program was uh, initially giving them sheep. 
so they were calling our cattle sheep, but hey, that's pretty close for me. Um, so that is a possibility. We at least proved that it would be possible to do that. But again, you would be limited to fairly small pastures just because of the battery life on a, a single drone. Another thing you could do is called object-based image analysis. And if you could see in this picture here, um, this is a road and all of this was really thick brush. And these rectangles right here are where there were aerial applications of herbicide applied. So this brushy area in between are the skips. So we did not spray that, but we sprayed all of these rectangles with herbicide. And what we did is we flew this and we flew another ranch in the same uh, area. And we used those, the data from those two ranches after ground truthing to actually identify which were mesquite, which were Wesatch. And we had a young lady that was a student at Texas A&M Corpus Christi um, run algorithms. And what she was able to do is identify with an 80 something percent accuracy off of just those two flights that you know everything light blue was say Wesatch and everything dark blue was mesquite. And those two brush species look very, very similar. So it was very, um, cool that she was able to get that level of accuracy after just um, a couple of flights. So that would be object-based image analysis. And you might think, well, what are you going to do with that? But if you know that you have to treat mesquite and wesatch at different times of the year and maybe with different types of herbicide, that would make a really targeted management decisions that can make your success a whole lot higher and make the herbicide use a lot more effective. Here's an example where they did some work with feral hog damage, and this was Aero Info, and uh, they worked with Skymatics to um, fly a pasture that had had some feral hog damage. They ground truthed what that area looked like, so where it was red, they knew when they went down there that that was indeed feral hog damage, and they were able to use mapping tools to extrapolate that over the pasture and found out that they had about 32% of the total field devastated by this feral hog um, uh, rooting. So this would be very helpful for either filing a claim or uh, for deciding when to pull the trigger on investing in uh, intensive management for feral hog destruction. So uh, maybe you want to set a certain threshold. When you get to that threshold, you feel like that's too much damage. You can't live with that. And I would say 32% of your pasture is well beyond what you would um, want to happen before you start to take care of trapping or doing something with those feral hogs. This is an example of the heat detection packages I was talking about. If you're not familiar with that, it's a pretty simple concept. They put these little stickers on the backs of the cows you can see here. Um, those stickers are like lotto tickets and when another cow mounts them it would rub off that um, sticker and they would know that that cow was not bred. So they would have to bring them all back in and rebreed the ones that um, had color showing on their stickers. So in this case, you can see right off that this um, patch here was a greenish color. So here's a little more up close. So this is what the patches look like. This one was completely scratched off. This one only was uh, half scratched off. So those are one way that you can monitor your reproduction of your herd. And you used to have to drive out there and try to see on the backs of these animals, but very quickly you could get a bird's eye view and see them from the air. Okay, I want to wrap up and then take questions if you have them, but I want to wrap up with rules. So we're talking about how to not get in trouble for flying a UAV or an unmanned aircraft. First off, when you purchase a drone, if it is um, over 0.55 pounds, then you need to register it. So all the little toy drones, those don't qualify, um, but if your drone, including the camera, is uh, over 0.55 pounds, then you'll need to register it with the FAA. They require that drone owners, um, anything used for either hobby or commercial purposes, register it. It's very simple. Um, you will actually go to their website, um, FAA Drone Zone, or go to registermyuas.faa.gov, and you'll fill in the type of drone you purchased, um, the serial number off that drone, and then you'll register it and pay $5. And it's very simple. They'll email you a registration number. 
you'll have to write that or put that on your drone in some way. So technically, you could just get a black marker, that's what I've done, a permanent Sharpie marker, and write it on your drone. You're then in compliance. So you have to keep that certificate that they send back to you in uh, your possession also while you're operating the drone. But it could be electronic. So you could, say, take a picture and save that on your phone somewhere where you could find it easily um, so that technically you have that on you. All right, so if you're flying just for fun, so you're flying as a recreational hobbyist, these rules were updated back in May and it really changed the game for recreational uh, flyers. So you have to not only register your drone and mark it on your aircraft, but you will also have to pass an aeronautical knowledge and safety test and then maintain proof of test passage. So that's brand new. That used to only be a thing for commercial pilots but now if you're going to fly for fun, they will be developing a test. It's unknown if that test will be completely online or if you'll have to go to a testing center to do it. Uh, but just know that they're still working on the details of that test, but it is coming soon. Also, if you're flying for fun, you have to fly in Class G uncontrolled airspace. So in controlled airspace, you'll need to file for an exemption online you no longer can just go to your local control tower and get a waiver. You'll need to apply for these exemptions online through the FAA. You also have to, of course, yield right away to manned aircraft and fly safely. You have to keep your drones within line of sight. Um, it is possible if you're trying to fly a very big area that you could have a visual observer out where your line of sight ends and their line of sight picks up and you two are in communication with each other. So you would still be the pilot in charge, but you could have somebody else helping with the line of sight issue. But you cannot fly over 400 feet above ground level. You have to follow community-based guidelines. So a lot of communities are starting to develop their own guidelines for drone flights. Um, so check with your town. For instance, uh, most towns have outlawed flying drones over uh, like little league games, but I believe like San Marcos still allows you to fly drones over little league games. So the rules may vary slightly depending on where you are. So be sure to check that out. Um, the Before You Fly app is a really good app to download. It'll tell you if there are any restrictions or requirements or any cautions in your area. Uh, so as a hobbyist, the Before You Fly app is what I'm suggesting that you download as a minimum to make sure that you're allowed to be flying where you are. So the question here is, uh, do you need a small UAS pilot license to fly your own cattle herd or your own wildlife operation on your own property? So here is our polling question. So yes, no, unsure, or doesn't matter, they would never find me. So yesterday when I spoke to a crowd, most of them said, doesn't matter, they would never find me. <laughs> okay, so looks like Half of you said yes and half of you said no, and the other percentage said unsure. So um, thank you, Pete, I appreciate that. The answer is yes. You absolutely need a small UAS pilot license to fly even on your own property because you don't own the airspace. FAA governs the airspace and you're making money off of your cattle or off of your wildlife hunting, then that would be a commercial use. So. Let's give you an example. Uh, if you're flying just for fun and you just fly over your cows, that's not necessarily commercial. But if you fly over your cows and you um, are looking at their herd health or making sure they're all okay or that they're all there or that they have feed in the trough or water in the tank, um, that's using it for an actual commercial operation because ideally, right, you are have you have the cows to make money. So that's a commercial use. Um, if you are feeding your wildlife, but it's not a business for you, you're not leasing your land and you're checking your wildlife feeders, then that's hobbyist. 
because you're hunting your wildlife as a hobby. But if you're leasing your property or you're selling hunts and you're checking your feeders, then you would need a license. Does that make sense? It seems very gray, but really it's cut and dry. Another example would be um, if I wanted to fly on my own for fun, I would not need a license. But if I want to fly during work hours for any work purpose at all, even for demonstration, um, I would need a license because I'm being paid a salary to do my job. So that would be commercial. Okay. Now, if you're flying for a business, what does that entail? It's really not that big of a deal, but um, this rule actually came into effect in 2016. Prior to that, all you could do is get a certificate of waiver or authorization. I call that a cover or something else, but certificate of authorization. Um, those are very expensive to get. They take a long time and very few people in the nation have a COA. So really they loosened up the laws, even though it doesn't feel like it, they actually loosened up the laws um, in 2016 to allow uh, for people to take this FAA Part 107, that's just the statute where it's written, knowledge test. So basically it's a small UAS pilot license. Um, and to take the test, you, oh, let's go to this one first. You must be at least 16 years old. Um, you have to pass the test, of course. Um, it's good for two years. You have to go to an FAA approved testing center. So ignore my comments right there. There's probably a testing center close to where you are. Um, we have one um, in Aransas Pass, close to Corpus Christi. There are four in San Antonio. They're, they're pretty spread out across the state. So you'll have to locate which one is right for you. Um, you have to be vetted by the TSA. So um, you can't be a psychopath and get your Part 107 rule, but um, courses are available that would help you work through the material that will be on the test. So originally, you know, I'm pretty cheap. Uh, I tried to do this on my own. You can get all the free materials off of the FAA website to study, um, but it was very tough for me because it was a little bit on the boring side for me. Um, I'm not good at airspace charting. I have not had previous experience with that. Um, and the weather, believe it or not, was quite tricky. Um, so I took a course, originally I took DART Drones. DART Drones is an excellent, well done online course that taught me everything I needed to know to more than pass that test. Um, but I think it costs like $250 and it's only good for six months. Whereas this last time when I had to renew, I took the Remote Pilot 101 uh, course. I believe it was $150, if I'm thinking right. And um, that one is good for a lifetime, basically. So I can log in in two years when I have to renew my license again. Um, I can log back into my account and use that information. Plus, they keep information updated. So if I want to just get a refresher on what the rules are, I could go through that course. So um, financially, that one might be a better way to go, even though I, I do have a lot of good to say about the Dart drone one. And there's lots of other companies offering courses. Those are just two that I have experience with that I could share with you. So even if you get your small UAV license, you're still flying within some pretty strict rules. So one is Class G airspace. Um, you have to keep your aircraft within line of sight. You have to fly under 400 feet during the day at or below 100 miles per hour, yielding right away to manned aircraft. You must not fly over people that are not a part of your project or what you're doing, and you must not fly from a moving aircraft. So it used to be that you could not fly from a moving vehicle, but now you're allowed to fly from a moving vehicle or boat. Sounds safe, right? Um, but you cannot fly from a moving aircraft. So um, if you had dreams of flying in a plane and flying a drone beside you, um, that is out. <laughs> but you can fly while you're in a vehicle. And I think some of this is like a lot of the drones have a, a function called follow me where you can hit that on your receiver and the drone will sort of um, follow your, your vehicle and that used to not be um, allowed, but now that is allowed. Um, a good website, especially for those of you who took the test, because it, it is necessary that you understand some airspace charting, 
is skyvector.com, really good place to get your airspace uh, charting maps and to see some information um, that's kept pretty up to date. Uh, it looks like Donna said, you cannot be the driver, only a passenger in a moving vehicle. Thank you, Donna. Yes, do not try to um, talk on your phone, eat, and drive with a drone. No, you need to be, but you can be in a moving vehicle now, and that used to be completely outlawed. Okay, so on this aeronautical knowledge test, um, there's a number of different categories, and how many questions you get on one will vary depending on um, who takes the test because the questions are presented at random. So no two tests are necessarily alike. So uh, for instance, in my first test, I had a lot of weather questions. On my second test, it's a little bit more abbreviated, but I also did not have many weather questions. So um, the ones that I highlighted, the airspace charting and the weather, those are the two that I found the most difficult, but they also tell you a lot of good information too about um, when you're allowed to uh, fly after drinking, um, the rules for decision making, how to communicate with um, other pilots or even listen in on radios and understand the commands that they're giving. So all of this is really valuable information that you do need to know and understand in order to fly and share that airspace with manned aircraft. So when we talk about airspace, we say fly in class G airspace. So I just wanted to say um, that you generally will learn this, but I wanted to make it clear that all of these uh, towers you see here, those are depicting different classes of airports. So obviously we have a large variation in airports because we could be talking about DFW, which is humongous, um, all the way down to uh, unpaved airports that maybe are not even controlled. So these would be depicted on your charting. And then class G is typically um, what's allowable outside of that. So they've reserved some area so those planes can come in and land and take off. So that's all we're talking about is the type of airspace that these are categorized at. And then we can only, so for instance, this one's saying that class G um, right here goes up to 700 feet above ground level, but as a pilot, unless you apply for an exemption, you can only fly up to 400 feet above ground level. So that's all you're really concerned about. Other restrictions include military operations, controlled fire areas. These will be depicted on your charting maps. Um, you cannot fly at stadium or sporting events one hour before or after or within three nautical miles of that stadium. Um, you cannot, under any circumstances, fly during a wildfire firefighting operation. Now, I had some questions about if you could fly during a prescribed burn. Yes, you can. Um, they've outlawed it from a wildfire firefighting operation, and that's just because they're trying to bring planes in there to drop material, and the last thing they need is for somebody's drone to be in the way. But again, if you're flying for fun, be sure to check out that Before You Fly app, Before You Fly, um, and then definitely if you understand charting, that sky vector gives you a lot more detailed information on that. So there's some new drone laws that have come through um, starting September 1st of 2017. Um, you cannot fly over correctional or U.S. Immigration and Custom Enforcement detention facilities. So if you're thinking about getting a drone so that you could drop a nail file to uh, a friend or family member who's in jail. That's out, so don't even bother. Um, you cannot fly over large sporting venues, of course, unless you have the operator's permission. Like sometimes they may ask you to do that or you may be hired to do that. And that, of course, is allowable, but they don't want um, to endanger the players, of course, or the people that are there to spectate. Um, you cannot photograph people or property with the intent of snooping. I get this question a lot. Um, if there is a drone on your property and they are not supposed to be there, remember they're supposed to be keeping their drone within line of sight. Um, if you feel like they're snooping on you, then you can contact your law enforcement. Um, you do not have permission to shoot that drone down. I get that question every time, so I'll just tell you right now. You cannot shoot the drone down, but uh, do call your law enforcement because those people should be nearby. 
um, if they're flying correctly in the first place and they do not have permission to be taking photographs or seeing what you're up to on your property. So this is my email address at the top. Feel free to um, save that or screenshot that. Email me anytime you have a question. I try really hard to stay up on these rules. And we're in a really big uh, changeover for, especially in the recreational side of things. They are being allowed to do more, but also have to answer more to the FAA. Um, so I saw that Donna asked a tricky question, Class G for fun. It does say that recreationalists can fly in a Class G airspace. Um, so if it's a controlled airspace, they have to get permission through FAA, just like commercial people do. Uh, but that seems to sort of have been uh, lit up except they are no longer allowed to go straight to the the airport and get permission to be there they have to actually go through faa if you are interested in drones and i'm going to assume that you are and i haven't turned you off from that today um, there is an awesome facebook page that's run by um, a guy who attended one of my presentations he started texas ag drone enthusiasts he does an excellent job of keeping up this Facebook page for us. Um, he posts new drones that are released, new uh, interesting articles about uh, anything controversial dealing with drones. He posts new rules as they come through from the FAA or even opportunities for webinars and such through the FAA. Um, and then there's this uh, small group of us who are drone enthusiasts who share photographs or interesting things that they're doing with drones that might give you some good ideas. So uh, kind of a cool uh, Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, go ahead and like us and um, he will kind of let you into the group, but it's not like we're real strict on who gets in, but it is kind of a closed group. So I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. We have a few minutes left. Um, any questions that you might have, please feel free to type them into the chat pod because um, I very well may have forgot something. I did skip over one section that talks about student exemption. So if you're reading, um, it does say something about student exemption, and that does not mean that if you're a student, you're allowed to fly all you want. It means that if you're a student as a part of an organized class learning about this technology, then you are allowed to fly for that class purpose but your professor who might be uh, paid or your 4-H agent who's paid a salary, they would need a license if they wanted to fly with you because they're doing that as a part of their job. Um, hope that makes sense. Um, Alan says, I'm interested in using a drone to do deer surveys for MLD. Does, does do these spook deer at 400 foot elevation? So I would say, no, they do not spook deer because it really kind of sounds like a small beehive. Um, it won't spook them. So they're probably not going to come out if they're bedded down in brush. Um, also, if you're going to fly to survey deer, you'll need to get a permit just like you would to survey them with a helicopter. So be sure you do that too through Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Donna said, not a question, but a suggested study resource. I use the app Prepware Remote Pilot to study for the exam. It was convenient and it's updated frequently. Awesome. Donna, would you type in if that cost you anything? And I'm writing that down. I appreciate you sharing that information with us because I've never heard of that app before. So again, everybody, that was Prepware Remote Pilot app. She said it was less than $5, so that's significantly less than those online courses that I took. Um, and then you still have to pay separately for that test. I should have said that. And I'm blanking on if that was like $150 or so. But you have to pay every time you take the test. So do make sure you study before you take it. It's not like you fail and they give you another shot. They give you another shot if you pay them the money again. Um, and again, that's good for two years. Oh yeah, Donna confirmed the test was $150 um, and that's something that you do have to take every two years. Uh, BS, oh man, okay, he asked, he, she asked, can you scout game, i.e. dove? 
So I would tend to think that that might fall under a harassment of wildlife. So I would be very careful about doing that with a drone. Yeah. Good question, though.